Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Spooky Soup Podcast. I'm Jesse. And I'm Tessa. So I have the Reddit story for today, and uh, you don't have to spoil it right now, but I'm, I'm excited to hear what you got for, this, for us this week. Yeah, I'm excited, too. It's a little bit of a lighter subject, so I think we'll have some fun. <laughs> kind of like a... Kind of a like breather a, a from last cleanser. <laughs> the last few episodes, yeah. Okay, sure, sure. All right. Well, um, we'll dive right in. Uh, before I get started on my story, just want to let everyone know that any images that are associated with any of our stories today, we'll be posting those on our Instagram and our TikTok. So look out for those. And then if you would like to send in a scary story, it can be true. It can be completely made up as long as it's spooky. doesn't matter. You can email it to us at uh, spooky soup podcast 801 at gmail.com or DM it to us on our Instagram. Yeah, send us your stories. You know the drill. If you don't send it, I will ultimately break into your house and turn your eyeballs into soup. So do it. So dark. Just kidding. For but legal purposes, that was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> Disclaimer. <laughs> okay, so uh, my story today is from r slash scary stories. And it was submitted by you slash Holly May Blissful. And it is called... My wife has been missing for 15 years until she called my phone out out of the blue. Ooh, that sounds good already. I don't like to talk about what happened 15 years ago. I don't even like to think about the fact that on January 7th, 2008, Sarah Collins, beloved member of the community, left home to run an errand and was never seen again. It was a huge case back then. Everyone seemed to want to know what happened to her but no one was more desperate for answers than I was. Sarah and I had been married for five years. I knew as soon as I met her that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with her. She had one of those smiles that just lit up a room. That's why it was so hard to believe that such a beautiful, successful woman had seemingly disappeared. They hadn't even recovered her body. 15 years later and they still don't have a shred of evidence. Not a tire track or even a fingerprint. Nothing. The police put out an appeal, but no one came forward. Somehow, not a single person had seen her. It was like she had just vanished without a trace. I think about Sarah a lot, actually. I could never quite bring myself to take down the photos of her from around the house. Sarah's bright face still smiles down at me from every, from every room. There's one photo of her from our wedding day that I really love. Looking at it is like looking straight at her. It captured her beauty perfectly. Two days ago, I found myself staring at it, really getting lost in the details. Her eyes, the way the corners of her mouth were lifting into a smile, the small dimple on her left cheek. I was looking at it so intently that I almost didn't notice the phone ringing. It was the landline phone, which was odd, as no one ever called me on the landline anymore. It was all mobiles nowadays. When I looked at the caller ID, It was an unknown number. I shrugged and picked it up anyway. It was probably just the bank calling to confirm something. The call took a moment to connect, but when it did, I heard a strange rustling sound on the other end of the line. Hello? I wasn't in the mood for prank callers. Is anyone there? Hello? Daniel? Daniel, thank goodness, I finally reached you. The voice on the other end of the line was a woman's voice, shaking and breathless. Daniel, it's me. It's Sarah. Are you there? When I heard her name, it was like my heart had stopped beating for a moment. Sarah. My Sarah. But that was impossible. Sarah had gone missing 15 years ago. Whoever this was, it was not my wife. I don't know who you are, but you're not Sarah, I hissed into the phone. Stop calling this number, please. I had dealt with a lot of these calls, especially when Sarah first went missing. Con artists, fraudsters, anyone who wanted to manipulate a grieving husband. I knew none of them were my wife. No, no, Daniel, wait, wait, wait. You have to listen to me. It's me, Sarah. You have to believe me. She was sounding shrill and desperate now, even a little hysterical. The lengths that people go to in order to sell a lie is astonishing. Why are you doing this? I asked angrily. It's been 15 years since my wife disappeared. What do you want from me? For a moment, the woman on the other end of the line didn't respond. I was beginning to think that the call had disconnected when she finally spoke. 
Daniel, please, it's me. It's your wife, Sarah, the woman begged. I'm telling you the truth, it's me, she continued to plead. But I had enough. I wasn't going to listen to this liar anymore. Do not call this number again, I firmly told her, hanging up. I thought that would do it. She wouldn't be likely to call me again. I assumed it was all over. The next day, I had asked a friend to help me repair my plumbing system. He was a good friend. I'd known him since college. He had been there for me when Sarah disappeared, got getting me through the entire thing. We were both taking a break, catching up on the important events in each other's lives, when my landline phone began to ring again. Sorry, I have to take this. It might be important, I said, getting up from my seat and making my way to the phone. I noticed that the call was coming from an unknown number, just as it had the day before. I didn't make a connection right away. After all, it could have just been the bank this time around. I picked up the phone, and I heard the same rustling sound. It was unsettling in a strange way. I almost felt like I had heard it before. I just couldn't put my finger on it. Hello? I was already beginning to get a good idea of what this call was, and I wasn't happy about it. I told you not to call this number. Daniel? Daniel, thank goodness, I finally reached you. The very same words that she had said the day before. Daniel, it's me, it's Sarah, are you there? It was undoubtedly the same woman. I do not have time for this, I hissed into, into the phone. I know you're not Sarah, stop calling me. I hung up the call and walked back to my friend, who looked very confused. Who was that, he asked. I heard you saying Sarah's name, is everything okay? It was some prank caller, trying to pretend to be Sarah. I told them, rolling my eyes. I thought that I had left it all behind. I even changed my phone number. I don't know how this woman got a hold of my new one. Pretending to be Sarah? My friend echoed. That's, that's pretty strange. Did you tell anyone about it? Like the police? I shook my head no. There's no need. It's just someone trying to cause a bit of drama. They probably want money or something like that. I made it clear that that was the end of the conversation. I didn't want to continue talking about it, bringing up harmful reminders of the past. I woke up the next day, not expecting to get any more calls from the unknown number. I made it very clear that I wouldn't be participating in her charade. However, I was quickly proven wrong. As soon as I started to walk downstairs for a glass of water, the phone rang again. I thought about letting it ring, but I had a better idea. I was going to issue a much stronger warning to the caller, even threatened to get the police involved if the calls wouldn't stop. That would scare her. I was certain of it. I picked up the phone, hearing the very same eerie rustling. I couldn't explain it, but it made a shiver run up my spine. Finally, the call connected. It was just the same as the other times, the same pathetic monologue. Daniel? Daniel? Thank goodness I finally reached you. Maybe it was a recorded message? Daniel, it's me. It's Sarah. Are you there? If you don't stop calling this number, I'll have no choice but to involve the police, I told the caller. This is harassment. If you want money, try conning someone else. Before I could even give the woman on the other line a chance to answer, I hung up the call. Hopefully this would show her that she wouldn't be manipulating me. I could see right through her elaborate scam. I was sure that my warning would stop the calls coming in. I was so sure of myself that when I was woken by a loud, persistent ringing sound the next morning, I didn't even think to connect it to the unknown number calls. I first assumed it was my alarm, waking me up, but when I turned to look, I saw that the alarm hadn't gone off yet. That was when I reached the conclusion that it was the landline phone. I rushed down the stairs, wanting to tell the caller that I would be taking police action, wanting to catch out the desperate scammer. Fortunately, I got down there in time and picked up the phone. Holding it to my ear, I heard that creepy rustling that I had become familiar with. It still made my heart beat faster, just for the few seconds until the call connected. Daniel? Daniel, thank goodness I finally reached you! The usual message of hysteria came through the phone. I was well used to hearing it by now. Daniel, it's me. It's Sarah. Are you there? I gave you a warning. I said if you called again, I would be taking legal action. I spoke into the phone loudly so that whoever was on the other side would be sure to hear me. You've gone too far now. I have to do something about this. I waited for the woman to respond. Daniel, no, no, it's me. I'm not lying to you. I would never lie to you. Daniel, it's me. Sarah, your wife, it's me. I can't stand the high-pitched whine of her, of her voice. You are not Sarah, I told her bitterly. 
I know you're not Sarah. I will be taking action. Goodbye. I I hung up the call for the final time and placed the phone back. I know that woman wasn't Sarah. I know for a fact she, I know for a fact she wasn't. I know it because on January 7th, 2008, Sarah Collins, beloved member of the community, was killed, and I was the one who killed her. Sarah was an incredibly beautiful woman. I couldn't believe my luck when she first started showing interest in me. I didn't exactly have a lot of experience when talking to women, and I was ecstatic that someone like Sarah had chosen someone like me. I loved her for every single second of our marriage. I loved her, even when I found out that she was cheating on me. I had actually accidentally stumbled across a string of romantic messages between Sarah and one of her coworkers. She was planning to leave me for him. Sarah, my Sarah, was planning to leave me for him. I couldn't have that. She was so beautiful, so bright, so full of life. I couldn't lose her. I just could not lose her. So, I killed her. I didn't have time to think about it for long. It was the only way that she would be mine, only mine forever. If she was dead, she would, ha- she would never leave me. She would always be my Sarah. When the police arrived, I made up an elaborate lie that she had gone out to run an errand and never came home. That very same lie ended up on headlines on the national news. I didn't know if I would even get away with it. But a year passed, and then another year, and then another. Fifteen years passed, and no one ever saw through me. I was about to walk back upstairs when I heard a small tapping on the window. Click. Click. That was the sound of the window opening, and that's when I heard it. Rustling. Right there in my own house. Rustling that paralyzed me with fear and sent my mind into a state of panic. Then I heard her. Daniel? Daniel, thank goodness I finally reached you. The voice was coming from inside the house now. Daniel, it's me. It's Sarah. Are you there? Ah, (laughs) that was so good. What a twist. Okay, so the original post um, did not have a part two, but then I uh, refreshed it. And the um, in the comments, the uh, the the author was like, do you guys want a part two? And everyone was like, yeah. So they posted a part two. So here's part two. Yes, that's the best news I've heard all day. (laughs) And it, it just it gets good. I could hear her clearly now. Daniel? Daniel, thank goodness I finally reached you. The voice was definitely coming from inside my house. Daniel, it's me. It's Sarah. Are you there? Panic rose in my chest. I don't believe in the supernatural, but all signs were pointing to something horrifying occurring. Something beyond a scam caller, desperate for money. My mind was a mess, debating whether to stay out of morbid curiosity or run as fast as I could out of the door and never look back. The rustling was so loud now, drowning out any chance of logical thoughts. Daniel! Daniel! Thank goodness I finally reached you! The shrill voice cut through my panic. Daniel, it's me! It's Sarah! Are you there? It sounded even closer to me now, like the source of the voice could only be a few meters away. Hello? I call out, hearing slow, small footsteps. Hello? Is anyone there? I stay rooted, I stay rooted to the spot, my legs paralyzed in fear. I still didn't know what was happening here, and I wasn't about to risk my life. Suddenly, it was as if someone flipped a switch. The loud, eerie rustling came to a stop, almost being sucked out of the room like a vacuum. I noticed that the footsteps had stopped as well, and after a few moments of terrified silence, the voice also seemed to have gone. I started to walk downstairs, my hands still shaking. What was that? What just happened to me? Could there be a chance that after all these years, I'm actually going crazy? I rushed downstairs to the phone, yanking the wires out and disconnecting it. I couldn't let a scam caller get inside my head. I didn't leave the house at all that day. The fear still made my head spin and my heart pound in my chest. There was no logical explanation for what what had happened. I didn't know what to think. When I woke up the next day, it was like something had changed. Something was different, and it wasn't in my mind. It was almost like overnight, everything had shifted. I wasn't an avid reader, but I had a small bookshelf in my bedroom with about five or so books on it. For some reason, it was looking a little empty. Was that just my imagination? I got out of bed and walked downstairs. I needed to get a glass of water. Clearly, my mind was going into overdrive. I was starting to become paranoid. I opened my drawer to get a butter knife for my slice of toast. When something caught my eye, 
an empty space in my knife rack. Every other knife was in the slot, apart from one. I could feel a lump in my throat. Knives don't just go missing. I pulled my mobile phone out of my pocket, not even daring to touch the landline, and called my friend Adam. I really was going crazy. Some sort of delayed guilt response, I guess. Whatever it was, I was afraid. Adam? I hissed into the phone. I don't know what's happening to me, but I need you to come over. I think I'm going mad. Adam promised to be on his way, and I didn't have to wait long for him to be at my door. When I let him in, he seemed concerned. Hey man, what happened? All right, your call freaked me out. You, you sounded scared. I think I'm going crazy, I explained as we sat down. I am seeing things, imagining things. I think it's something to do with Sarah. Hey man, losing your wife is tough, Adam agreed. He doesn't know what really happened to Sarah. I know how that feels, continued Adam. Ten years ago, Adam's wife, Laura, had suffered a fate similar to Sarah's. She had gone out to work one day and never returned. It was tough on me, as Laura, being her best friend, was the closest thing I had to my Sarah. It was 15 years ago, I said wide-eyed. How is it only hitting me now? About a year after Laura went missing, I really broke down, Adam told me. I started getting really paranoid and suspicious. It took a few years of therapy for me to fully accept everything. I nodded, pretended, pretending to understand. Therapy won't help me. It seems like nothing will help me. I pretended to listen to the rest of Adam's advice until he had to leave. I told him that I would try out some of, some of his coping methods, but in reality, I had no intention of doing so. That night, I found myself tossing and turning, obsessing over everything that had happened. The phone calls, the disappearances, I, I just couldn't sleep. Begrudgingly, I got out of bed and walked over to the medicine cabinet in search of some sleeping pills. I didn't use them often, just when I couldn't sleep. I felt around in the cabinet for the pills, but they were nowhere. I flicked on the light and looked again and they were missing. This wasn't my mind playing tricks on me, this was actually happening. I raced down to my basement. I don't step foot in the basement often, it just reminds me of everything. It reminds me of them, because that's where they are. The victims. That's right, I said victims. Multiple. It started with only Sarah, but I couldn't live with myself knowing that her lover was still out there. The man who had tempted my Sarah away. He had to go. I lured him to my house with a great plan. Once he was here, I got him, got him a drink, and we talked. A drink laced with sleeping pills. He was dead within the hour. The next one was Laura, Adam's wife. She didn't just go missing. She was killed, and I did it. I had a good reason. She found me out. She found out what I did to Sarah. She had rushed over to my house to confront me. In a panic, I killed her. I killed her with the book from my bedroom. One sharp blow to the head and she was dead. And the knife was Sarah. I didn't, want, I didn't want her to be afraid. I couldn't have that. She was my Sarah and I loved her. I didn't want to frighten her, so I stabbed her in the back like she stabbed me in the back by cheating. I stabbed her with that knife from my knife rack. She fell to the floor like a sleeping angel and died. And the knife, well, the knife was in my hands, but I didn't put it there. My vision was clouded, but I could see that I was standing in my basement. How did I get here? I don't remember the past few minutes, but my hands closed around the bottle of sleeping pills. The sleeping pills? I try to bring it up to my face, my entire body swaying. My sight keeps going and reappearing, and all I can feel is the blood rushing around my body. I feel a small, heavy object. I'm holding the book now. Wait, but that's impossible. I drop the book to the floor, my legs suddenly buckling from under me. I fall to the ground, just like each of the victims, my eyes closing slowly. I can't feel a thing anymore. I imagine this is what happened to them. I imagine that this is what they felt, too. Just before my eyelids close, I almost think I can see something in front of me. A face. A face I know so well. Sarah. My Sarah. Oh, that was so good, too. Well written. So well written. It was very reminiscent of Joe Goldberg from You on Netflix. That that's a good comparison. Yes, the book, mm -hmm. the you know the cheating and killing the cheater and the lover and yeah, so good. I didn't even make that connection. Good job. Thanks. Thank you, Holly. Holly once again, Holly May Blissful. That was a great story. Um, yeah. So let's just get right into your story. What do you have for us today? All right, so today 
I'm going to be telling you the true story of Utah's wild, wild west. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I love a good western story. Oh, I think you're going to like this one. Now, this is a story about the infamous ghost town of Grafton, located in southern Utah. So about 20 minutes from the main entrance to Zion National Park, tucked below the rusty red mesas of southern Utah, accessible only by dirt roads, sits the abandoned town, which is made up of an old schoolhouse and church, a few homes, a hauntingly beautiful cemetery, an old barn, and long-forgotten farmer's fields. While this ghost town is relatively small, don't let it fool you. It's rich in history. Grafton was established in 1859 by farmers, and with the start of the Civil War in 1861, it quickly became the land of cotton. To supplement the dwindling commodity, LDS leader Brigham Young sent people to southern Utah to grow more cotton. Now, the Paiutes, who were already inhabiting this land, were happy to help at first, showing people the way of life and living in harmony amongst the Red Rocks. But soon, the pioneers started taking more and more land for their crops and their cattle, more than they originally bargained with them for. And this land was essential for the Paiutes to use for their own sustenance. This led to long forged feuds between the two groups. In 1862, however, their dreams were shattered by a flood that raged through the valley, forcing Grafton to move a mile upstream. About the immense flooding, I found this tidbit of information from the Grafton Heritage Partnership Project. And it says, A resident of Virgin wrote, The houses in Old Grafton came floating down with the furniture, clothing, and other property of the inhabitants, some of which was hauled out of the water, including three barrels of molasses. Grafton settlers relocated to higher ground one mile upstream of their first town where the current town site now, re- now stands. Grafton's existence is a testament to the early settlers' perseverance and industrious spirit. Now, the town has been a backdrop for many Western Hollywood classics like Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid. Now, if you had the same history teacher I had, you definitely watched that in eighth grade. <laughs> sure did. Sure did. And it makes sense why this would be a popular filming spot, especially when considering the view is immaculate and the surrounding red cliffs and fields of sage and prickly pear cacti are abundant. When driving to Grafton, the first thing that you'll see at the end of the dirt road is a wire fence cemetery with an easily maneuverable gate. Inside the cemetery gates, you'll find Pantera. Just kidding. (laughs) You'll actually find some really peculiar graves that are sure to pique your curiosity. Among the weather tombstones, you'll find lumps of red clay dirt signifying the placement of a corpse laid to rest just slightly below the blanket of earth. You'll find a homemade wooden and metal grave marker for someone named Cedar Pete. He was a Native American man who was laid to rest in the same row as many other southern Paiutes at that cemetery. You'll also find a tombstone, which happens to be the tallest tombstone in the cemetery, surrounded by a wooden fence, and this is the only fenced-in tombstone. And upon closer inspection, the tombstone reads, Robert M. Berry, killed by Indians. M. Isabel Hales Berry, killed by Indians. Joseph S. Berry, killed by Indians. All three died on the same day, April 2nd, 1866. Joseph and Robert were brothers and Mary was Robert's wife. The trio was visiting from a small town and they were making a stop in Grafton. They made plans to travel along a route back home, which would take them near Short Creek, also known as Colorado City, which also happens to be the town where FLDS leader Warren Jeffs would rise to disgraceful infamy years later. But before the Berries left Grafton, someone from the town was made aware of their travel plans and advised them not to take that path. People were known to travel that way and be robbed and or would never return. They decided to go along with their plans anyways, which was a really big mistake. When the Berries never returned home, a search party was sent out into the desert to find their wagon. Along their path, there was a dried up wash with steep walls where they had to take extra time to get their wagon up and over the other side. 
Inside the wash, the search party found three bodies of the Barry clan and their mules. There was an apparent struggle between them and a group of Paiutes who had seen their wagon go down in the wash and jumped on the opportunity while they were in a moment of struggle. According to a page I found on myfamilysearch.net, it says... It appears that they attempted to escape by running their horses across the country and finding they could not do so, fought desperately for their lives, but in vain. One dead Indian was found nearby. Joseph was found laying face down in the wagon box. His leg had been bandaged, no doubt, while they were fleeing as fast as they could from their attackers. Isabel had been shot through the head with a six-shooter and was lying on the ground, while Robert's body was astride the wagon tongue with the head leaning into the wagon. The Native American said afterward that Robert was a, quote, heap brave fighter. While the exact details of the rampage are not known, it's believed that the, tri that the trio was attacked at some point with an arrow, striking the neck of one of their mules first, causing it to buck and scream in pain. At some point, Joseph's leg was deeply injured, and he had attempted to bandage the wound in an unsuccessful escape attempt. Robert fought desperately and greatly for his life and Isabel's life, but ultimately, they were both killed. Back at the cemetery are numerous graves for other townspeople, mixed with indigenous people. Among the graves are many who died from illness, two children were buried who actually died from a broken swing incident. One nine-year-old boy died by being dragged to death by a horse. The first time we went to Grafton, we stopped at the cemetery, and there actually happened to be a group of people doing a ghost hunting session using a spirit box and an EVP recorder. I have no idea if they caught anything, but it was really fun to chat with one of them about their Silence of the Lambs t-shirt, which happens to be my favorite movie, and it said Buffalo Bill's body lotion <laughs> on their shirt. Nice. <laughs> Past the cemetery, a little further down the dirt road, is the actual town of Grafton. The church was used as a school building and is closed off to, vil to visitors, but most of the other buildings are completely open to roam and to take photos. It's such a fun place to go get a glimpse of the Wild West and to explore abandoned buildings, at least during the day. I can only imagine how frightening Grafton is at night, particularly in the old buildings with dirt cellars and old windows that people used to look out of. It's odd standing in their place and thinking that just the next day, the trio would die from an ambush in a dried wash. Being one of the most photographed towns in the American West, people are bound to happen upon things that fall on the side of unsettling. The cemetery contains about 80 known graves, but some are unmarked, so the number could be much higher. Many of these graves are children. It's said that the cries of a child can be heard bouncing off the tombstones, echoed with sounds of babies shrieking in need. And most chillingly, the sobs of a woman in a dress wandering around the cemetery plots can be heard. Because this is such a famous ghost town, there are people who do tours of it, offering to do photo shoots of their subjects clad in pioneer clothing. And reports of this woman in the cemetery are the same, that the witnesses believe her to be part of an act, that perhaps the sobs are merely part of a pioneer show for which she's adequately dressed in the right period clothing. As they approach the actress, she disappears into thin air as if she never existed. Was this the grieving mother of those lost to illness? Maybe she was once known as Isabel Berry and has come back to visit the graves of her children left behind after her untimely death. Whatever the case, Grafton is one of those ghost towns where you go and think, yep, that's a ghost town. It's got everything. Terrifying deaths, robberies, western desert mesas, an abandoned church and schoolhouse. I mean, those are the makings of a horrifying ghost story, right? Definitely. This all goes to say that if you're ever visiting Zion National Park and feel inclined to connect with the past, you absolutely cannot miss out on Grafton. I promise it's worth the visit, and who knows what kind of specter of the West you might encounter along the sandstone tombs. I have not been there. You need to go. You've, you've told me about it, and uh, that's cool. I didn't know about that story. Yeah, we've been twice. And the first time we went, we saw the Berry's tombstone. And I was like, what makes these people so special? that <laughs> They're like fenced in within the fence. And when I looked up their story, I was like, 
oh, wow, this is what's in the movies. That makes sense. Yeah, this is insane. But yeah, it's so fun because most of the places are open. So you can just go tour around and you see like the original sandstone bricks and the wood like floorboards. And then in the cellars, it's all dirt and cobwebs. It's it's pretty creepy, but it's really cool. How many uh, buildings are left standing? Do you know? So the school and the church were the same building. So there's that one. There's a few houses. There's like three or four houses in a barn. And then like maybe a shed or a shack here and there. But Okay, so yeah. it's, it's pretty, uh, it's like a smaller area then just with yeah. a few buildings. Yeah, and it's all just like dirt all around. So you can just walk around super easy. Mm-hmm. Um, okay, cool. Be- I was just curious because uh, I wasn't sure if it was like a full town or just like a small little little uh, block of buildings because um, that's even that alone is pretty cool that they're still standing um, some of the buildings, especially the, the church slash school. Yeah, and on that note, I don't know if this is anything paranormal, totally natural or what, but when we went, um, we looked through the windows of the church house and inside were just thousands of dead flies and i'm not even kidding it was like thousands like the floor was painted in dead flies yuck it was so weird none of the other buildings had flies in them just a church huh yeah hmm. maybe there was like a dead mouse or something in it that was rotting and mm-hmm. so it pulled them in i don't know something under the floorboards it could have been easily but i just remember seeing that and being like Yeah, that tracks. (laughs) This place is so creepy. Sketchy. Yeah. Sketchy. And how big would you say the church building was? Oh, not too big. I'd say you could, if you really squeeze, you could fit like 50 people in there. 50? Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty small. But it's it's small. Like you'd be standing shoulder to shoulder. Sure. Okay, cool. Well, is uh, there anything else you want to share? That's it. All right, guys. Thanks for listening. We will scare you in the next one. Stay spooky. Bye.